Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Pocket Dojo podcast, to the final episode of Series 2. My name is Paul Crick. And I'm Arsha Singh. Arsha, so here we are. We're at the end of Series 2. And about you, but I think we've got a massively wonderful body of uh, conversations. Um, how's it been for you? It's been fantastic. I mean, I feel I have quite sort of mixed emotions actually about things coming to an end. You know, on the one side, or oh, end coming to their natural end. Let's say, you know, mm. on the one side, it feels like that. It feels like you know we've we've created some really interesting conversations, like you just said. We've also created some, you know, I think fantastic content actually that that people can you know have access to in different ways in in perpetuity. Let's say. Um, which feels really great, and I know that I'm certainly going to be, you know, using bits and pieces uh, as I move forwards, which I'm sure you will as, as well in different ways. And at the same time, I'm kind of sad, you know. There's, it's sort of I'm not a good finisher, but this has been one of the um, experiences I've had, you know, of coming into something with we didn't know each other really when we started this. No. Um, and and we're you know going in different directions that we'll we'll speak a bit about a, a bit later. But um, it it feels like you know there is there's it's definitely a sort of a threshold actually I was going to say milestone but I don't even want to use that word a threshold so something has been created and something is being crossed and part of that crossing is is you know wrapping this up as we are today um, yeah what I about that, you yeah I think that's I think that's fair comment I think uh, I mean for series two we had the the idea that this was going to examine the spaces in between and I know the conversations have sort of gone in slightly different different ways even though we've sort of followed um followed a path of asking similar questions of guests yeah. Yeah. um and and therefore what has emerged is the spaces in between so I think in one in one respect you could almost say job done um and, yeah, in, a, and in another in another respect it's shown how diverse people are and uh how similar they are as well in how we all seem to want the same things um broadly uh you know if you took a 50,000 foot view of that you could probably say well yeah everybody wants the planet to continue everybody seems to want uh and recognize that there's a need for us to do things differently uh and everybody wants to make a contribution so at that level it's for me it's it's a very hopeful a very optimistic um series of episodes that we've we've pulled together and you know the diversity of guests that we had has has, has been uh, wonderful I, I always like a cosmopolitan uh, range of guests and then it's sort of circled to a to a common a common view uh that that perhaps we didn't really engineer in terms of oh well we pick this guest because we know they're going to talk about this we'll pick this guest because we're going to talk about that it was it was really reaching out into our networks and saying who'd like to come and and express a view and share their perspective and their experience and i think i think we got that yeah absolutely i really like the way you just summarized that actually at the beginning of what you just said there you know that there was almost this kind of organic formation of this container if you like about the spaces between you and i and then the conversations that you know we were having with other people mm. um so i wonder you know i'd i'd be curious just to hear from your side and we don't really need to go into any great depth because people can go back and watch the episodes that interest them in particular but were there any sort of overarching themes that popped out for you you know in the course of those conversations when you think back to them now i, I think i think there's one um, which is it it seems to be about I'm going to use the word mindset, but it's about how we think um, mm -hmm. and how we make meaning uh, in the world now and a, and a recognition that either that can change uh, because it needs to or because people are already on that path of uh, thinking differently thinking thinking outside of the mainstream um and i would say the mainstream is you know exploit nature uh take the resources make money and profit and you know we'll worry about the 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 consequences of that further down the line even though we're aware of those consequences and uh not quite someone else will take care of it but you know we'll do our best to do no harm 
to a shift to no, there there is a way to have purpose and there is a way to create profit and there's a way to do that in a way that um is equitable and um has an ecology to it uh in that it's it it serves to produce oxygen or doing other things or things that need to be done in the world um it also is ecologically sound in that it considers the environment and and unless let's not do any harm but mm. how do how do we not do harm and build back and then a, a recognition that the old models um the the neoliberal models of you know short term profit really aren't the focus are broadly damaging in most categories and therefore there is a, a recognition of a shift what that shift is and how to plan for it seems to be the stumbling block and the obstacle yeah. right now yeah absolutely so you know you just mentioned earlier about the fifty thousand feet view and you know pretty much any i think Decent, reasonably healthy person in the world would say something similar and might use different language, but essentially it will mm. be that and future for their kids and a world worth living in and you know all those kind of things. And and it's when it comes down into greater granularity, let's say you know like that a fifteen thousand or twenty thousand foot view, mm. that's when things start to get really tricky, and that's where all the most of the risks, you know, existential risk, etc., kind of start to form actually. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I definitely saw, you know, that that sort of global, let's say, overarching kind of value system and the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, the models that we've used, the ways we've been thinking about life and therefore how we need to organize and flourish are, you know, in all, to be fair, coming just coming to their natural end. So they started, you know, I think I'm right saying this, I'm not an economics expert but by any means, but, you know, I think they started from the Bresham Woods meeting back in 1944, so looking at a world that had been pretty much destroyed and for the first time, obviously, with the, the nuclear bomb, um, that we, we overstepped that kind of threshold. So you're thinking, okay, so, you know, what on earth do we do now to prevent that happening again? So, you know, obviously the, the powers that won had more influence in, in how that developed. And so I guess the priority at that time was firstly peace, then it was prosperity. We've got to rebuild back. And if we provide more prosperity to a greater number of people, perhaps we'll have more peace in the world. And that probably felt really, you know, difficult actually to do in those kind of conditions. And in a sense, we've kind of come to another threshold. You know, we're not, I hope, not going to be in a similar kind of, you know, condition for for world peace and and whatever. Although there are plenty sort of you know fires going off around that, that we have to to do that because obviously you know next time round it's not going to be a whole lot left. But I think we're at that sort of point of okay, so what we did before doesn't work, and, and we can't just have another world war to reset that to zero and start all over again, which is what we've done throughout our history in different ways. So that thinking really needs to evolve. And I think that's definitely happening. It's the transition away from that to something that we might describe as regenerative or more sustainable or more inclusive, fairer, you know, whatever kind of adjectives we want to put there. Those are the things that are really tricky, you know, because it, it means that we have to give up a lot. We might need to give up a lot. Uh, we might need to be far less kind of individual than the capitalist, neoliberal, democratic, whatever world has encouraged us to be in order to flourish. And, you know, that's not an easy thing. And then there are plenty of other sort of, um, you know, forces to stop that. But coming back to the, the podcast conversations, you know, coming down at that that kind of slightly lower from, you know, maybe let's say 20,000 feet view, um, there were definitely some interesting similarities that came out in the stories you know that that, that i heard or that, that i was part of those conversations so um i didn't certainly i don't think either of us at the beginning you know of doing this series of podcasts sat down and thought okay we're going to ask you know like you say we're going to ask such and such a person because we know they're going to talk about x y z mm -hmm. those people came fairly organically at mm -hmm. least i think for both of us really um and and I certainly asked my guests similar, very similar questions, and then you know let the the, the conversation flow and, and and respond to that naturally and spontaneously, etc. But I still had a sort of path that you know I wanted people to follow, which I found really useful and and helped some really interesting you know stories to come out. 
But what was really curious to me, I just literally, you know, read some of the transcripts back, you know, thinking about today's uh, last episode today and seeing where some of those things, you know, what was what was similar between what were the patterns, let's say, between uh, those stories. I mean, that's something that I kind of do naturally and and do in my work. It's part of, you know, managing complexity, et cetera. Um, But there were a few, actually, and I'd love to get your views on them as well, if there's any kind of similarity. So the first one was about you know people's early life experience shaping some of the decisions that they've made more recently but that's only become clear quite recently so you know the importance of our early experiences the world and therefore how we make sense of it and meaning going back to, to what you just touched on um and so you know five very different people with very different backgrounds from anything from like growing up in in the hills and forests of northern japan and having loads of freedom to you know roam around and be close to nature that was catherine to uh, claudine who grew up in in germany and had a corporate career later and and a much more structured much less free and i'm i'm making assumptions so claudine if you see this and I, my assumptions are wrong you know forgive me um but and then you know thomas who grew up in in was born in california but i think grew up in in germany and his parents who were natural scientists and we're talking at the kind of five-year-olds you know dinner table about existential risk which is not something that most of us would have experienced and just how these different you know tensions and experiences or whatever have shaped people's paths and choices i think you know that's normal kind of human um, experience at structure. But then there was a key point for all of the five people that I spoke to, Anita, and I can say and relate to this because it's also happened for me a number of times, when you could no longer do what you were doing before because your sense making it outgrown whatever it taken you into that in the first place. So, so there were key moments. So Susie Lewis, for example, talking about her corporate career and and all the great opportunities, which is where she and I met actually the client that she was organization she was working for was a client for me. Um, you know, loads of opportunities, things she'd never imagined she would, you know, have the chance to do. Um, lots of learning, lots of impact in the fact that she could, you know, make a difference. And at some point she got really fed up with the constraints of a very large uh, organization system. Mm. Not an uncommon story, but not everybody gets out of it. Uh, and um, who was the other person I saw? Ricardo, Ricardo Desai. So a filmmaker, very kind of different conversation, but just talking about his own experiences of of you know inner development, inner growth that led him to change you know what he had been doing in the world to make money, etc., and and set out on very different on a very different path. So this kind of key transformation, if you like, an inner development journey, which I'm you know I'm sure you can speak to as well. So this this the themes are you know very different life experiences but the fact of life experiences shaping you know your decisions as a young adult whatever and that at some point in your life and not necessarily correlated to age in any way but this process of almost like kind of being in a chrysalis like a pooper you know coming out as a butterfly and people having this inner experience that changes them and then they go and do something else i don't know if you found that in in the conversations that you had I think there was some of that. I think I think my conclusion is that that is a natural process of human mm. development for everyone, irrespective of their backgrounds. Yes, sure. yes, all their, their their conditioning comes into play, mm. um, but we do we do seem to get a sense of you know things shift um, as we mature. Let's put it that way um, sure. in our in our thinking and our ability to make sense of uh, what's happening in the world. And I think there comes a point where people people. Do want to shift, and and the stories that they were told, they no longer are, are no longer their stories. They want to write their own stories. Um, so I think there is a common theme of I want to self author. I want to do my, I, I, I want to have my impact in my way, um, in my world. But how how people do that is is very 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 different. Whether you're uh, coaching teams like Dan, or whether you're trying to. Uh, fund uh, ventures to protect the environment, uh, like Bessie was. So, um, it's it's a part of life, I think. Um, the the challenge is, is we're all at different stages in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you said, you know, there's there is a risk to that. There is a risk of changing that identity, 
shifting your position in terms of status and belonging mm -hmm. to those structures that you belong to because you've said actually i think i've outgrown this now mm -hmm. uh, and that becomes a challenge in terms of do i stay stuck um because circumstances are such that the transition journey i need to make uh, means i need a plan that needs me to unshackle various things that i need the resources to do the courage to do the support to do or am i in a place where actually i've got relative freedom and actually the shift is relatively straightforward mm. and i can I can simply map out uh, a three to six to 12 months journey that says I'm going from roughly from A to B and I'm comfortable if it isn't quite B, but you know, I know where I'm, I, I know what my, I know what my intent is. Um, and I know I, I have a plan to, to realize that. So I, I think that was, that was a very much a common theme. What else, what else came up for you? Um, I think another thing that actually really struck me, you know, looking back at these, so that I know they struck me at the time and they also struck me earlier today, just reading back through the transcripts about, you know, one of the questions I asked at the end was, was you know, words of wisdom for people on that journey. You know, having gone through, uh, each of the guests that we interviewed, you know, has gone through their own kind of journeys in different ways. And like you say, I think that is, you know, a natural part of maturing through our lifetime. But not everybody chooses to do that, you know, no. it doesn't happen to everyone. So I think there is an element of choice in that. But the, the thing that struck me was, was you know, their words of wisdom, uh, having gone through experiences themselves and very kind of tangible, at least to my mind and, and experience, tangible, you know, concrete things that people can do to help them if they have that kind of niggling doubt about, you know, what future am I are we creating for like, our kids or, you know, I want to, to not use plastic or, I mean, whatever, you know, things that, that small changes, let's say that we can make without needing to, um, you know, turn the world upside down. So, um, you know, there was, there were definite kind of similarities in that. I'm just looking at a, a few notes that I took for myself earlier because there was so much in those transcripts, um, you know, about obviously about an inner space of, of, keeping our own balance through change, which is is so important, you know, and we're all going to have our own different ways, our own gigs, you know, for whatever that that might be. Um, and then using that time to educate ourselves in in whatever way that that feels right. So it's sort of unlearning and, and relearning um, and definitely that kind of chrysalis stage of becoming somebody new. You know, it's it's not just a question of, of learning new skills or exploring new interests or whatever, there is this kind of transformational stage that happens to us so that we show up differently. You know? um, and I think, you know, that that definitely happens naturally. It's it's how much attention and space we give that's really important. Um, and then another, you know, really key thing was was the importance of connecting with people. So connecting with, whether that's you bringing you know, big transformation around because you have a, a, a corporate role that that requires you to do that or changing your life completely. So, you know, my dear friend Simon and his conversation talking about having to wrap up his business, which was fantastic, and he's regenerating it into something much better, quite frankly, um, which we're just starting to explore. Or, or um, you know, Claudine, who left her 20-plus years in in you know, big corporate mm. responsible kind of positions because she felt, you know, this sort of nudge from inside that she could no longer do what she was doing. So, um, you know, find it, and her, I think, sort of nugget, golden nugget, was about finding your purpose, which you just touched on before. You know, so there's three things about just creating space for yourself so that you can become somebody new, connecting with people during that space to both to educate yourself and have a sense of community so you're not feeling alone in doing it. Um, and then finding a real sense of purpose, which, you know, I've been on this kind of path for decades and I'm only really finding my purpose now. It's not something that is, you know, unless you have a sort of true vocation for something, it's not something that's necessarily that clear. Does any of that resonate with you? In the yeah, I think so. I think, I, I, I think, um, I, I think I would hear and see similar things, not just in the, in the podcast, but just reading around the whole topic. Mm -hmm. You know, people are, people are going through that process of, of transition and 
all the things you refer to are are helpful to that. I think the one thing that struck me was purpose isn't perhaps something you find, it's something you do. You know, you, you, you mm -hmm. discover it along the way of becoming. Um, mm -hmm. And it's by putting one foot in front of the other that sort of it reveals itself because um, my coaching supervisor came up with a wonderful term, which was actively divesting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you actively divest from the things that no longer fit. Uh, mm -hmm. Your your worldview, your uh, capacity uh, for energy and, and to give time to certain things, whilst they may be interesting, I think we all get a sense of, you know, shrinking, uh, shrinking time or time going faster. And therefore we make more judicious choices about where to expand that energy. So no, I hear, I hear all those things, uh, too. Uh, I, I think, I think it was a, a phenomenal, um, set of guests. So where, where now, where, where, yeah. where are you, where are you headed? Cause as, as we said at the top of the show, um, this is kind of it for this, uh, for the pocket dojo as the podcast and, uh, we're off to go and do sing the something. So yeah. tell everyone what you're up to because it, cause it's pretty amazing. Uh, thank you. So I'm not going to reveal too many details so far because okay. things are coming out in the next few weeks, but I can I can sort of paint a broad picture. And it's, it's interesting. I'm going to add a little piece to that and ask you the same question in a minute. Yeah. But, you know, I've been, it, it's been a really um, powerful experience for me in making the podcast. You and I coming together, we didn't really know each other to begin with. Uh, coming together, you know, creating something from nothing. We didn't really, or well, you had some experience. I had no experience with the tech or, you know, speaking to a camera. I am actually finally looking at the camera all the, most of the time, well which is great. So, yeah. So, you know, I've learned a lot and I guess, you know, what, what I've learned, if I was going to summarize it, it's not quite this simple, but I put this picture on it for now. You know, I've learned to, to be comfortable in my own skin which I think mm. also is going to you know relate to to some of the work that you're doing so I'm a good testament to to what you might share in a moment um and and I found a voice that is absolutely mine and I'm now starting to share that in different ways that's a, a, a simple answer to your question um so there's the spaces let's say between you and I that have been created through series two of this podcast have allowed me to step out into the arena that feels absolutely right for me now which is about bioregional regeneration okay. Uh, I'm really interested in making that accessible to more people. So I'm involved in different projects to to make that happen. It's all very new, so I'm, I'm not going to say too much about okay. it. Um, and also, you know, looking through that through that lens about different kind of business models. We've touched on that with different guests, you know, during the series two. So I'm creating a new business in a new way that I've never really <laughs> considered doing before. We're playing with it. We're testing it. You know, we're doing lots of different things. And I'm really curious just to see what comes out of that. So in essence, we're regenerating ourselves. And in doing that, we're making regenerative principles, practice, um, you know, you use the word mindset. I don't like the word mindset, but yeah. uh, it's what comes to thinking, let's say, you know, yeah. how could we organize ourselves differently that is not, are not, you know, extractive capitalist, neoliberal, whatever, because we can see that breaking down everywhere and hold the line through the storms, which, you know, are, are raging in lots of different places for different reasons. And, you know, bring forth that beautiful world that we've talked about in different ways during the podcast. That's kind of how I would, would um, colour, let's say, this, this space for me. And what about you, Paul? What's well, that's, similar, that's, different? That's, that sounds fantastic. Well, yeah, colouring the space in a different way. Um, I've, uh, this, this phrase active divestment, you know, particularly as I turned 60, uh, recently, um, Congratulations. <laughs> yes, I made it. Um, I think the, the phrase active di divestment is front and center at the moment as to, as to what I want to hold on to and what I want to, what I want to let go of. And, and some of the things I want to let go of are, are, are words and phrases that on the surface seem, 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 um, irrelevant in, in a, you know so like the word leadership you know I, i'm i'm almost tired of that word now and and it's been so disabused so misused and misunderstood and it's a whole linguistic nightmare as to what we mean by it and what i'm more interested in is i don't really care about that what are what are we doing to take to to encourage people to step out on new journeys 
and how do how do I accompany them on on that? Uh, I think I think that's that's more important. I think I also want to lose the word coach. I think I think that's a word that um, for me at least has 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 lost any any real meaning. Uh, there's lots of people who are good people who are in that role. The good ones tend to be doing the work rather than teaching other coaches to be coaches, uh, teaching on courses, courses that, that that teach on courses. So I think, and I think technology has a role now to play where, you know, it can become the accountability buddy. You know, the, there are things you can do through technology to automate the, did you do the task, you know, this, that, and the other. Sure. Um, it's more interesting to dig into the, so, so what are the, what are the hidden obstacles or assumptions or internal assumptions that you're telling yourself that are conditioned that need to be unlearned as we've said in this you know in in, in the course of things to help you move forward so i'm really interested in doing that and i'm interested in working so a lot of my my clients when i when i step back to think about well what what lights me up when i do work and it, and it is doing this change it's seeing people make the transition from from you know place A to place B um, and reconnecting to the resources they already have or connecting them for the to them for the first time and, and just supporting them there in that journey, which sounds very twee and very easy, but actually it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to help people do that, particularly the unlearning, particularly anything trapped in the body that's Absolutely. been a difficult experience. Um, that's, that's, I think, is my work. Is 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 the uh, helping people do that? You know, I I, I don't want to help people become seg- seven figure coaches. I mean, good luck to those that do. Um, that's fine. Uh, there's the, those people are out there, and uh, and I get that. And um, there's sporting coaches, and that's great. And you know, long long may they continue to do their great work. But the work I want to do is I want I want the the voiceless to to help them find their voice or to the people that haven't quite found their voice to step into that. And to, to you know, I had a, an interview with a, a lady last week. And as I, as I went back through the transcript, I mean, it was, ex, it was extremely moving to read what she was openly saying in, in the, in the call. And you just think, how the hell does the word at world get to this stage and, and you know, go back far enough, we can figure that out. But, so, so I'm more interested in in how do I support people in actually making change and doing work that does that, rather than talking about coaching, rather than trying to invent new things of coaching. You know, here's a blank space, put a new word in front of it, and sure enough, you've got another course and another degree in coaching. Um, I want to look at our human condition. We know what we need to know. <laughs> Excuse me. We know what we need to know broadly. The majority, I would say 90% of what we need to do to make the change we need to make already exists. My view is we know enough, you know, we don't need more certifications. We don't need more degrees. What we need is more connection. What we need is to celebrate the spaces in between us and, and bring them together. In my view, to have conversations that we're not having, that everybody knows we need to have to then, uh, lift everybody else up, including ourselves and. I want to be part of that very much. Um, and for me, that's working, that's working with, uh, strong accomplished women. Yeah. The, 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 I published an article the other day that suddenly struck me. I read someone else who, who talked about the statistics. We know all the statistics. We don't need to know, we don't need to do another damn study on the plight of women in the workplace. What we need to do is we need to change the constraints to move from empowerment, which in my view is, is potentially deceptive and, and performative to actually removing the system constraints, which is all about emancipation. Uh, and we need to move into those areas. And if uh, there's a way I can help people to do that and on whatever scale, uh, and, and help, help women to do that, then that's my work. You know, I've, I've got a lot of experience of working, working with that particular group of people. So that's what lights me up and that's where I'm going to go. Which is fantastic. And, you know, and I can really say with my hand on my heart, dear Paul, that, you know, my experience of of doing this with you has absolutely done that for me. You know, we didn't enter into a coaching agreement or or any kind of process in that way or whatever, but that is who you naturally are. And that's your gift. 
I, I to me in, in our interaction, it's been your gift, one of your gifts. And, you know, I think you're going to do a fantastic job because without having done this together, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Uh, and um, I'll send you the money later. <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> Whatever great. works. So, so, so that right. feels like, you know, a good place to, to, to call us a wrap, I guess. It does. All it leaves me to say is, first of all, thank you to you for being a fantastic partner. What people don't see behind the scenes is the amount of work that Asha does in terms of uh, researching, scripting, organizing how we're going to do uh, various episodes, sourcing guests, getting things organized. Just a phenomenal amount of work uh, to make that happen. And uh, you know, in encouragement because there's other things that goes on go on in our lives aside from the podcast, and you know, it's it's not all smoothness. Uh, the, there's the occasional bumpy bits. So just yeah, you know, being a support and a, and an encourager and someone that fans the flames. Yeah, you know, I, I I salute you and say you know heartfelt thank you for making this podcast series uh, what it is a body of work that stands up on its own uh, and is you know can rub shoulders with most of what's out there i would suggest so thank you yeah likewise and you know the the other part that people don't see is all the tech stuff that i could never have, have done or even kind of wrap my head around which you know has been absolutely you've just taken you know such great care of and and as as all of that has just really helped me as a, a a stepping stone sounds a bridge maybe is a better expression you know okay. to to what i'm doing now and so you know the the heartfelt thanks are are returned or exchanged reciprocated thank you it's well there's what well, there's also one set of thanks that that we need to give which is to everyone who uh, agreed to be a guest thank you for being fantastic guests in your own way it's always a it's always a privilege i think to see people uh, step up and shine a light to the world and then the lastly, I'd I'd like to say thank you to everyone that did listen, uh, did download. We have some statistics, so we know you did listen. Anyway, it wasn't it wasn't gathering tumbleweed. It has it has been listened to uh, as a body work. Uh, it it will stay online, uh, and it and it's there. But thank you for taking an interest. Thank you for watching the YouTube videos. Thank you for listening to wherever you listen to it. Uh, it's greatly appreciated by both of us. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. And we're we're going to continue uh, publishing uh, on Substack. So, Asha, where where can people find you? Uh, on my Substack, Learning Through Doing, on LinkedIn, and then you'll see my new activities. If you're following me anywhere there, you'll see them coming up very soon. And I'm going to keep the Pocket Dojo going, um, both as a channel on YouTube. Uh, we'll come up with a. The, there are some things in the works coming that you'll see uh, probably next spring. Uh, and I will keep writing on the Pocket Dojo at Substack. And of course, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn if that's something you would like to do. So Thanks I so think, uh, yeah, I think in true to Ronnie's fashion, it's a uh, good night from me. And it's good night from him. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.